This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 28. Coming up on Space Time, mysterious signals from the galactic center. Is the Milky Way galaxy getting bigger? And could life exist in the clouds of Venus? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered that a mysterious gamma ray signal being emitted from the centre of the Milky Way galaxy is most likely being generated by rapidly spinning neutron stars. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, solves a long-standing mystery about the origin of these strange signals. Researchers had been speculating that the gamma ray signals could be a sign of dark matter interaction. But the new data from NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has given scientists their clearest view yet of the gamma ray sky in this energy range. And the signals detected by Fermi closely traces the distribution of stars in the galactic bulge. While the centre of the Milky Way galaxy may well be rich in dark matter, it's also populated by ancient stars that make up a structure called the galactic bulge. And based on the Fermi data, scientists now think the signal's being emitted from thousands of these 10 billion year old millisecond pulsars. Pulsars are rapidly spinning neutron stars, the super dense cores of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have exploded as core collapse supernovae at the end of their lives. The gravitational collapse of these stars is so intense that the protons and electrons in their atoms are crushed together, forming neutrons. Hence the name of the star. One of the study's authors, Dr. Roland Crocker from the Australian National University, says at the distance to the centre of our galaxy, the emissions from many thousands of these whirling dense stars could be blending together to imitate the smoothly distributed signal expected from dark matter. Millisecond pulsars close to Earth are already known to be gamma-ray emitters. The new findings tend to rule out the rather provocative theory that the gamma-ray signal could be a signature of dark matter. Scientists have no idea what dark matter is. They know it exists because they can see its interaction gravitationally with normal matter. There's broad scientific consensus that dark matter is widely present in the universe and helps explain how galaxies hold together rather than flying apart as they rotate. Dark matter is thought to be composed of weakly interacting massive particles, which would be expected to gather in the centre of our galaxy. The idea is that very occasionally these particles crash together, generating gamma-ray energy. Crocker says the gamma-ray signals his team have detected very closely match those of neutron stars rather than dark matter. What we found is that the particular signal called the galactic centre excess, which had been claimed to be a, a signature of dark matter, is not a signature of dark matter. But of course that doesn't mean that, that there's no dark matter there. It just means that this, this signal is not the evidence for dark matter that it's been claimed to be. So as far as we know, we still need dark matter for a bunch of reasons. And even in, in the galactic centre itself, there's dynamical evidence that we need dark matter to be there. It's just that this particular idea that this galactic centre excess signal, which is a gamma ray signal, it's a very energetic light signal could be explained by the annihilation of a particular candidate dark matter particle called a WIMP, self-annihilation. That means that two WIMP particles in the large overdensity of dark matter that one might expect to exist in the centre of the galaxy, that, that when they meet, they create this gamma ray signal. And that we've shown that that's not what is happening. And instead, it's neutron stars. We think it's neutron stars. It's the most likely thing. But to, again, to be strict, what we've really shown is the gamma rays somehow connected to the stellar population. And so it's some sort of astrophysical source, which belongs belongs to the general population of stars, which is responsible for the gamma rays, and probably these particular type of rapidly rotating neutron stars called millisecond pulsars are the candidates. And so there's quite a bit of prior work which has already suggested that. So, but again, to be strict, we're not saying that that's for certain. We're just saying that the signal that we see is actually connected to the stars that are there. How are millisecond pulsars created? Well, this is an interesting question. It's actually a subject of ongoing search and, and debate. There's something spinning them up, isn't it? That's right. So, so the, the, the scenario that, that people, you know, more conventionally think about or, or discuss is something called recycling. And that's a situation where you have a neutron star in a binary system and, and the, the neutron star has been created by a particular type of supernova, what's called a core collapse supernova. So it's basically, it's the final state of a star with, with a mass, an initial mass, something like something more than about eight solar masses, eight times the mass of the sun. 
it undergoes this thing called a core collapse supernova and the remnant of that thing, that event is called a neutron star, super dense matter. And if subsequent to the, you know, it could be billions of years after the neutron star is created, that neutron star starts to accrete gas from a companion in a binary. So the binary itself could have been formed as the stars themselves were formed. So that is that there's always been a companion star in that system, or it could have been formed dynamically. So, you know, for instance, there are some particularly dense stellar environments, globular clusters, or perhaps even very close to the center of the galaxy, where stellar encounters mean that binaries can be spontaneously created or they, they can have their characteristics altered so that you can go from a system which is basically the stars are not interacting with each other and, and they're somehow brought closer together through an interaction with a third star, for instance. And then the neutron star starts to accrete matter. Anyway, so it could have a complicated back history and it starts to be spun up by the accretion of this matter from the companion, which could be, for instance, a giant star. And as it gets spun up and accretes it, it becomes a strong X-ray source. And then finally, after the accretion process is completed, then what you're left with is, is a neutron star which has been spun up to very um, short periods, that is, it's rapidly rotating, with a period in the range of a few milliseconds. Now, that's the scenario that, that people mostly consider and, and think about. We're actually interested in an, another scenario, and one of the reasons why we're actually interested in, in a, another scenario is, is because of this phase that I just talked about with, with the recycling idea, which is that when the neutron star is being spun up, it undergoes this phase of being a strong X-ray emitter. And there are actually constraints on the number of such strong X-ray emitters that there are in the inner part of the galaxy where we're interested and where our signal was coming from and other people have said that we don't see enough of those uh, strong x-ray sources for the gamma ray signal to be explained by millisecond pulsars which are being produced by recycling so we step around that problem if there's another channel to produce millisecond pulsars and the other channel that we're thinking about and actively researching is something called accretion induced collapse and that's where you start not with a neutron star directly but with a very massive white dwarf a particular type of white dwarf called an oxygen neon white dwarf which should be close to the Chandra Sekar mass so that's 1.44. Uh, one, that's right, sol solar masses. So, and a white dwarf with a larger mass can't support itself against its own gravity. And what can happen in these particular oxygen neon white dwarfs is as they accrete matter, instead of exploding as a, another type of supernova or a type 1a supernova, that instead they actually collapse down into a neutron star at, at that point. And because of the basically just the conservation of angular momentum, the white dwarf itself is basically spinning. It has a radius of a few hundred kilometres and it spins down to something which has a radius of kilometres and conservation of angular momentum basically just means that it's going to be very rapidly spinning when it's, when it's finished that process. Like an ice skater bringing their arms together as they spin. It's exactly that phenomenon. And so, and this is a way of producing uh, such a millisecond pulsar, but without undergoing this, this X-ray emitting phase uh, as the thing is, uh, undergoes this uh, recycling process. And that's just a hypothesis at this stage, which we're investigating. We don't have any direct evidence from the analysis in this paper that what's really actually happening here. And as I said, in general, all we really know is that the gamma ray signal is coming from stars or from, from an astrophysical source which is connected to the stars that are there. But we think this is probably, this is our best guess as to what it is. And sorry, just to be clear, it's not just one of these things. It's many thousands of them that would have to be acting in concert so that their integrated gamma ray emission looks like a more or less a, a continuous distribution of gamma rays over that part of the sky, mimicking basically the sort of signal that you would get from dark matter. That's Dr. Roland Crocker from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that the Milky Way galaxy is getting bigger. The findings, presented at the European Week of Astronomy and Space Sciences in the UK city of Liverpool, suggest that the galaxy is expanding at a rate of about half a kilometre per second. The Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy, about 100,000 light years across. Our solar system is located about 26.4 thousand light years from the galactic centre on the Milky Way's Orion Cygnus spiral arm. We think the galaxy hosts somewhere between 100 billion and 400 billion stars, as well as huge amounts of gas and dust all intermingling and interacting through the force of gravity. The nature of this interaction determines the shape of the galaxy. In the case of the Milky Way, it's a spiral galaxy. Other galaxies, however, may look elliptical or be completely irregular in shape. More precisely, the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy. 
It consists of a disc with arms and stars, dust and gas, which lies mostly on a flat plane, with the arms stretching out from either side of a central elongated bar-like structure. The disc of the Milky Way is home to a huge and varied stellar population, ranging from massive, hot, very luminous blue stars destined to live fast and die young with relatively short lifespans of just a few million years through to low-mass red dwarf stars, which burn through their fuel supplies far more slowly and are likely to live for many billions of years. In fact, scientists know of no red dwarf star that has died in the 13.82 billion years of the universe's existence. Many younger, shorter-lived stars are also found in the disk of the galaxy when new stars are continuing to form, whereas older stars tend to dominate the galactic bulge around the galaxy's centre, as well as a halo of stars that surrounds the disk. Some star-forming regions are found at the outer edges of the galactic disk, and many models of galaxy formation predict that the new stars will slowly increase the overall size of the galaxy they reside in. One problem in establishing the shape of the Milky Way is that we live inside the galaxy, and so astronomers need to look at other galaxies in order to find analogies of our own. The study's lead author, Christina martinez Lombilla from the Astrophysics Institute on the Canary Islands on Tenerife, together with colleagues, set out to establish whether other spiral galaxies similar to the Milky Way are getting bigger, and if so, what that means for the Milky Way. The authors used the ground-based Sloan Digital Sky Survey for optical data, and the Galex and Spitzer Space Telescopes for near-ultraviolet and near-infrared data respectively. This allowed them to look in detail at the colours and motions of stars at the ends of the disks found in other galaxies. The researchers measured the light in these regions, which is predominantly originating from young blue stars. They measured the star's vertical movement up and down through the disk in order to work out how long it takes each of the stars to move away from their birthplaces and how that makes their host galaxies grow in size. Based on these calculations, they determined that galaxies like the Milky Way are growing by around 500 metres per second. The work therefore shows that at least the visible part of galaxies are slowly increasing in size as new stars form on the galactic outskirts. What it means is that in, say, 3 billion years' time, the Milky Way should be about 5% bigger than what it is today. Not that that really matters. After all, in about 3.7 billion years from now, the Milky Way will collide with our bigger neighbour Andromeda, M31, and the shape and size will then change dramatically as the two galaxies merge. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Scientists are speculating as to whether or not life could exist in the dense atmospheric clouds of the planet Venus. This latest hypothesis, reported in the journal Astrobiology, follows the discovery of microbial life in Earth's upper atmosphere. Until now, the search for life beyond Earth has focused on one mantra – follow the water. That's because liquid water is essential for life as we know it. Consequently, astrobiologists have always been looking for places where we know liquid water is likely to exist. For example, Mars has geological features which clearly suggest that it once had and possibly still has subsurface liquid water. Other targets include Saturn's moons Titan and Enceladus and the Jovian moons Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. However, microorganisms, mostly bacteria, are also capable of being swept up into Earth's atmosphere, where they've been found alive at altitudes as high as 41 kilometres by scientists using specially equipped balloons. And that's raised the possibility that the dense clouds surrounding Venus, which do contain water vapour, shouldn't be dismissed all that quickly as a potential site worth searching. Venus is Earth's sister planet. Both bodies are similar in size and composition, both orbit the Sun in a similar part of the solar system and were built from the same basic components. However, Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect, meaning surface temperatures are over 460 degrees Celsius and atmospheric pressures are 100 times greater than that on Earth. Any water that was on the planet's surface would have evaporated away billions of years ago. When it does rain on Venus, it rains sulfuric acid and metallic snow falls on the mountaintops. So, while Venus may well be Earth's sister planet, it is somewhat of a twisted sister. This new work follows up on speculation over the habitability of Venus's clouds, which was first raised back in 1967 by noted biophysicist Harold Morowitz and famed astronomer Carl Sagan. Decades later, the planetary scientists David Grinspoon, Mark Bullock and their colleagues further expanded on this idea. 
Fast forwarding now to 2018 and planetary scientist Sanjay LeMay from the University of Wisconsin-Madison has furthered the case for the atmosphere of Venus being a possible niche for extraterrestrial microbial life. LeMay says Venus has had plenty of time for life to evolve on its own with some models suggesting Venus once had a habitable climate, with liquid water on its surface for as long as 2 billion years. Now, if true, that's far longer than on Mars. Then there's that ever-growing catalogue of extremophile microbes known to inhabit incredibly harsh environments on Earth. These range from life forms in the hot springs of Yellowstone and deep-sea hydrothermal vents through to highly polluted toxic sludge and acidic lakes. Some microbes feed on carbon dioxide and produce sulfuric acid, while others, known as methogens, produce methane as a metabolic byproduct of anoxic conditions. The highly reflective and acidic atmosphere of Venus is composed mostly of carbon dioxide and water droplets containing sulfuric acid. Supporting the notion that Venus's atmosphere could be a plausible niche for life, a series of probes were launched to the planet between 1962 and 1978. They found that the temperatures and pressure conditions in the lower and mid portions of the Venusian atmosphere at altitudes between, say, 40 and 60 kilometres would not preclude the existence of microbial life. Adding more fuel to the fire, some bacteria on Earth do have light-absorbing properties similar to unidentified particles that make up unexplained dark patches observed in the clouds of Venus. In fact, spectroscopic observations, especially in the ultraviolet, have shown that the dark patches in Venus's clouds are composed of concentrated sulfuric acid and other unknown light-absorbing particles. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Richard Branson says Virgin Galactic will soon be back on schedule following the successful completion of the first powered test flight of the VSS Unity spacecraft. The flights come two and a half years after the fatal mid-air breakup which destroyed the VSS Enterprise. Unity was launched attached to its White Knight 2 mothership Eve and taken to an altitude of 46,588 feet or 14,200 metres where it was then released to drop clear of the White Knight and then fire up its rocket engine. The winged space plane undertook a 30-second powered ascent, quickly accelerating to Mach 1.87, or 2,309 kilometres per hour, and a peak altitude of 84,272 feet, or 25,686 metres. That's almost 26 kilometres above the ground. Unity then carried out a conventional landing back on the runway at the Mojave Airport, 72 minutes after its initial takeoff and 11 minutes after its separation from the White Knight 2 mothership. Unity's predecessor, Enterprise, crashed and burned in the Mojave Desert after one of its test pilots unlocked the space plane's feathering re-entry system, allowing it to move into the feathered position as it was ascending supersonically through the atmosphere, killing one pilot and seriously injuring the other. The feathering system rotates the wing and tail section booms upwards into a V-shape, reconfiguring the spacecraft by increasing atmospheric drag to stabilise the vehicle and help slow down its rate of descent, just like a shuttlecock used in the game Badminton. The feathering manoeuvre should only be performed during unpowered freefall descent. Instead, it happened during the powered ascent. Once the spacecraft slows down enough to handle aerodynamic flight, the wing and tail section would be rotated back down into the straight position, allowing the spacecraft to glide back to the runway. The feathering system works on Spaceship 2 because it's only flying to the edge of space, just over 100 kilometres, so its re-entry speeds are far slower than the speeds orbital spacecraft need to travel at so the feathering system's more than enough to slow it down safely. On the other hand, orbital spacecraft re-enter at far higher speeds, requiring heat shields to protect them when they're in the atmosphere. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. SpaceX has launched another 10 Iridium Next communication satellites aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. The flight used the same core stage used to launch another pack of Iridium satellites last October. The mission, which flew from Space Launch Complex 4E at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, had been delayed by a day due to issues with one of the Iridium satellites. The mission represented the fifth launch of 10 satellites for Iridium, which is building a new 75 satellite constellation for its expanding satellite phone business. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. An Ariane 5 rocket has placed two new telecommunications satellites into orbit. 
Ariane Space Flight VA242 blasted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou Spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the Hylas 4 and DSN-1 Superbird 8 satellites. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage du Vulcan. Allumage des EAP, décollage. And right on time, as the DDO says all is normal on board, Ariane 5 began her mission, leaving the ground here in French Guiana with a roar of the engines, a lot of fire, and with two new satellites. Everything okay on board, the DDO says. The two boosters are providing 90% of our thrust right now, propelling the launcher along her trajectory as she reaches into the open sky above the clouds at an ever higher velocity. 774 tons at liftoff, remember, and to get that sort of mass off the ground, you need a lot of push, and push we have. She's burning five tons of fuel every second, two and a half tons in each booster, plus the core stage burning another 300 kilos per second. Les paramètres bord sont normaux. Ariane 5 now following the program in the onboard computer, which gives all the orders, including stage separations, which we will soon see. At a minute and a half into the flight, we're in the first of four flight phases. Right now, the first flight phase, the single first stage engine, and the two boosters are burning. The boosters will each consume their 240 tons in just over two minutes, and they're the first to be extinguished. You'll hear that. This first flight phase using both cryogenic fuel and storable propellant in a mix, cryogenic propulsion offering certain advantages like better and more precise performance. You can turn it off and on. Its motors also function longer. There is a separation of the boosters, looks like the flame out. DDO has confirmed it. Boosters flaming out as they drop. They fall 500 kilometers from shore into a protected area. French Guiana was in part chosen as a base for its opening on the water. Launches posing no threat to the local population. The speed we need for satellite separation is 9 kilometers per second. Fairing separation coming right on time, revealing our two satellites to the elements. We can separate the fairing now because we're out of the dense layers of the atmosphere, over 100 kilometers up, so there's neither friction nor heating, which could disturb the passengers. We can also get rid of any dead weight, which to, to maximize the launcher's performance, and the fairing weighs almost two and a half tons. The 5,348-kilogram DSN-1 Superbird 8 was the first payload to be released, some 25 minutes after launch. It's designed to provide satellite communication services for Japan over the next 15 years. It was followed eight minutes later by the deployment of the 4,050 kilogram Hylas 4, which will provide broadband and connectivity services for Africa and Europe. It's also carrying enough fuel for a 15 year lifespan. The launch marked the 68th flight for the Ariane 5. I'm Stuart Gary, this is Space Time. And time now for a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. And phase one clinical trials of a new HIV vaccine, which may have the potential to prevent AIDS, are about to begin at four sites in the United States. The tests by the University of Massachusetts represents the latest front in the battle against the deadly disease, which has already killed tens of millions of people over the past three decades. The study will monitor the vaccine's ability to create an immune response against HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus which causes AIDS. In one trial group, the vaccine design depends on using limited DNA sequences from HIV as an initial priming immunization for the immune response. That will be followed by a boost with a protein vaccine matching the proteins made by the DNA. In the second trial group, both the DNA and protein vaccines will be given at the same time. The approach of using both DNA and protein vaccines, whether in series or together, activates both antibody and cell-mediated immune responses, both of which may be needed for an effective HIV vaccine. 
This type of vaccine strategy, which includes a mix of proteins from different viral subtypes of HIV, is considered the most likely to stimulate broad immune responses, thereby offering the best hope for an HIV vaccine. The vaccines being used in the trial include five DNA components and four proteins to stimulate potent and broad immune responses. A new study warns that the West Greenland ice sheet is now melting at its fastest rate in centuries. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, shows that melting in West Greenland since the early 1990s is at its highest rate in the last 450 years and perfectly matches the profile of climate change being caused by human greenhouse gas emissions. This additional warming has caused an e-doubling of melt rates in the 20-year period from 1995 to 2015, compared to previous times. The loss of ice from Greenland is one of the largest contributors to global sea level rise. Now, sticking with the problems of climate change and global warming, it seems the Great Barrier Reef is facing yet another threat, with new research showing that when oceans become more acidic, there's a 34% drop in the reef building process of calcification. The findings reported in the journal Nature show that the higher levels of CO2 in the environment are making oceans more acidic. And for the first time, researchers were able to simulate this in a 400 square metre area of the ocean surrounding One Tree Island, 100 kilometres off the Queensland coast. The authors say that if deep cuts in global CO2 emissions are not made, the decrease in coral's ability to build and repair will compromise ecosystem function. A new study has confirmed that the famous winged dinosaur Archaeopteryx, once thought of as the earliest bird, was capable of flying. Until now, whether this feathered dinosaur was a ground dweller, a glider or able to fly was an area of active debate among paleontologists. Now, a report in the journal Nature Communications indicates paleontologists have been able to peer into the bone structure of the fossils and compare them to the bone structures of other flying animals, ranging from ancient pterosaurs to modern birds. They found that the wing bones of Archaeopteryx perfectly match those of modern birds that flap their wings to fly short distances or in bursts. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 